Excellence, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's great to see you all uh, and welcome to what I think is one of the most uh, consequential initiatives coming out of Glasgow. So Secretary Kerry, John and myself decided before uh, Glasgow that we wanted to mobilize the global industry uh, for net zero and the most effective way would be to create the demand for green products, to use the purchasing power of the largest companies in the world to then demand in different sectors uh, greener aluminum, greener steel, greener fertilizers, greener shipping, greener air uh, space, and etc. And we are here with uh, more than 90 partners. I'm so proud of your leadership as the President's uh, Special Envoy for Climate Change, uh, John, but also what you've done uh, in service for your country uh, for more than 60 years. Senator, Secretary of State, and now the Special Envoy uh, for uh, Climate Change. Your leadership is stellar, uh, the energy is higher than ever, and um, I feel that this is kind of uh, our common baby uh, that you're now uh, gonna um, also explain uh, for us uh, what we have achieved and what we can achieve uh, moving forward. So let's welcome Secretary John Kerry. Ladies and gentlemen, Borger Brenda, president of the incredible World Economic Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, I accept the nomination. <laughs> I, sorry about that. Just kidding. I should tell my boss, just kidding. So, uh, thanks for joining us here today. It's a terrific turnout. And uh, many of your CEOs and owners or board members, uh, chairs of boards of uh, important companies around the world, and you're here in Dubai because of the importance of this moment. Uh, I want to begin by just thanking Borga. Borga and I are long-term friends. He was foreign minister when I was secretary of state, and we did a lot of things together on the Middle East and elsewhere in the world. Uh, he's a terrific public servant and a terrific president of WEF, and I think we're grateful for his service. It, Dubai uh, <clears throat> is our best chance in recent years, I think, to make the Paris Agreement uh, more real and to hold ourselves accountable to the future and for the future. And I can't stress enough to all of you, I mean, you know, if you think some young people are tired of the wor words, and they are, you've heard that complaint, a lot of us are tired of the words too. Uh, I first started this journey on climate back in 1988 when Jim Hansen testified to us in the United States Senate. And back then, we had bipartisanship. Republicans and Democrats would talk to each other and go out to dinner together and make things happen. And we did so, all of us going to Rio in 1992 for the Rio First Earth Summit. And after that, we went to many places, many, many places, in Poland and, you know, uh, in, in uh, Bali and in Indonesia. And you, you know the number of cops we've had. If you've had 28 cops, you've been almost 28 different places. And in Paris, we lifted the spirits of the world with the notion that we were really gonna meet this crisis. And make no mistake, it is a crisis. I did an event with the Munich Security Conference just the other day here, but gave a speech in Vienna this last year at a session that was about climate and security. And you already see what's happening with security challenges around the planet when citizens of states have to escape the place they live because they can't live in the place they were living. Can't grow the food, don't have enough water, have conflict as a result of the things that are happening and changing, the dependencies of life suddenly shift. So this is a critical time. Yes, there's Ukraine and a completely unprovoked illegal war taking place. And yes, there's Gaza and the continuation of a saga that's been going on for years and which is at a critical moment and there are people now who are climate refugees leaving their homes and trying to move across borders and find a place to live and to 
have what they see the rest of the world has in a world that is so interconnected. Nobody misses anything that anybody has or does. So in the middle of all of that, we've come together from Glasgow, where in Glasgow we decided we have to change the paradigm. You can't just talk about the supply of fossil fuels. You have to also talk about the demand for fossil fuels. And you have to talk about the demand for carbon products that didn't have a value attached to them that represented the damage they do in the world. Coal is number one, by the way. Anybody who suggests you ought to build a coal plant today and that it's cheaper than anything that doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. Because coal is so much more expensive, particularly if you did an honest accounting. Who does an honest accounting? How much is it worth that eight million people a year are dying all around the planet because of the lack of quality of air? Or the costs in hospitals, in the billions. In America, the largest cost of hospitalization of children is every summer when you have environmentally induced asthma. And these kids are in distress and they go to the hospital. We spend about 55 billion on that. Taxpayer money. So the issue is for all of us, from whatever country you come from now, you see what's happening. In the Arctic last summer, it was 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. In the Antarctic, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. In Europe, the Rhine River was not navigable, so they had to stop for a while. The water in France and the rivers was so warm, they couldn't use it to cool the nuclear plant. And we've seen distress in so many different ways, in floods and famines and droughts and mudslides and fires and you name it. And just yesterday we learned that this year, hottest year in history, and nobody's that shocked because last year was the hottest year in history, the year before that was the hottest, and the hottest decade, and the year before that was the second hottest decade, and the, year before, the years before, 10 years before that was the third hottest decade in history, and that is accurate. Decade for decade. So when are we human beings going to acknowledge that we have been given this gift of being rational, allegedly, and we have the ability to not do things that are the definition of insanity, which is if you're digging a hole and you get too deep and you're not going where you want to go, first thing you got to do is stop digging. And the equivalency of stopping digging on this subject of climate is to stop emitting these, these poisonous gases that are destroying the planet and the lives of future generations and our own ability to live. So, um, now I'm not pretending that can be done overnight. I'm not suggesting people have to give up a standard of living. On the contrary, there's a better standard of living out there waiting for people. And jobs that, right now in the United States, we're filling up renewable energy jobs are being filled up with people who had technical skills in extraction technology. And it's translatable to these new technologies which are coming online. And the greater growth in our country today is in renewables. But it's not fast enough. Not fast enough here, not fast enough there, not fast enough anywhere in the world right now. So, long preface, but I think an appropriate one to the challenge that is being met here by a group of business people, some of whom historically have been cursed for creating the problem, or some of whom have been told, all you're doing is greenwashing. Well, no, that's not all people are doing. There are people out there taking risks, putting their companies on the line, putting their bottom line on the line, in order to make the judgments that will encourage a more rapid transition to this clean energy economy that we have to get to. Now, I am 100% certain, having followed this saga for these years, that we will get to a low carbon, no carbon economy in this planet. We will. What I'm not certain of, and what I don't think anybody can be certain of, is that we are going to get there in time to do what the scientists told us in the 2018 report that we need to do, which is make the decisions now and implement them. This was five years ago. They said you have 12 years left within which to put the, in place the decisions that will avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. They didn't say avoid the crisis altogether. They said avoid the worst consequences. So for all the world to see, and I want the world to see, we have major businesses that have stepped up 
major businesses from around the world, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Salesforce, uh, United Airlines, uh, Lafarge Wholesome, one of the largest cement makers in the world, uh, Fortescue, Andrew Forrest, and others, people from around the world who have said, we're going to help send the demand signal to the marketplace that will begin to change this equation so we can accelerate the transition to the new clean green economy. And, and what comes with that, folks, and I think most of you here understand this, we're not asking anybody to give up the quality of life. We're asking you to actually embrace a better quality of life. If you're not dying because the quality of air sucks, then you got a better quality of life. You're not being sent off as a young person to fight a war to protect the sources of your energy, where energy is now being weaponized. You got a better life. In fact, you even have a chance to stay alive and live it. And, and so it is true with respect to any number of that health, broadly, writ broadly, we now understand health is a major issue with, from climate crisis, and it's linked, totally linked. So, you know, we have these hard to abate sectors, aluminum, steel, uh, transportation, shipping, trucking, aviation, but they're hard partly because for a whole bunch of years they were just ignored. I can remember going to Paris. We didn't even hear the word methane in Paris. And here we are years later with a major announcement this afternoon with China, the United States, and, and the UAE joining together with other countries that are going to say, we're going to up our effort on methane, and here's what we're going to do. And it's, I won't pre-announce pre it. But the, but the World Economic Forum joined with EU and US, President Biden, who made the announcement in Glasgow, that we're going to find business people who have a special sense of responsibility, who understand what the stakes are, who are prepared to buy green now in order to send a message to the marketplace that it's safe, you can do it, and it works. And that will embolden other entrepreneurs to come out and start their business, which in turn will accelerate <coughs> the transition, and then we can begin to scale them at uh, super speed, I hope. So I think this, this is one of the best things we've done at COPS, frankly, is come up with the First Movers Coalition. But we need more country, country we need more companies to step up, be part of it. Uh, we have, for instance, Apple and Salesforce and that group I mentioned, they're buying, of all their flight operations, they're making sure that they're buying sustainable aviation fuel to support X amount of those uh, operations. Uh, in the case of Ford Motor Company and General Motors, not small enterprises, folks, and Volkswagen and Hyundai and Toyota and Mercedes and blah, 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 all of them are now making commitments to buy a percentage of the steel they use to make the cars that will be green steel. And so the makers of the steel know they have a buyer, and that encourages other people to come into what would be a growing market. So let me just emphasize to every single one of you, and I'm not going to go on very long here, but I want to just emphasize, in this transition that we envision, which is the single biggest economic transformational opportunity since the Industrial Revolution, and it's going to be bigger, because we have four and a half to five billion users today of energy, and there are eight billion people on the planet, which means there's a gap, and we have to fill the gap, so we have people not complaining about they're deprived of the opportunity to have a decent life uh, and that it's limited only to certain countries that have already developed, et cetera. We have to address that. But we also have to look at the fact that those, those folks are now buying steel that's green, that's helping them move the market. And in fact, our, our, the members of the First Movers Coalition have now signed 96 offtake agreements in support of their commitments. That's really pretty extraordinary, folks, because those offtake agreements give confidence to this market to begin to develop. Scania has sourced offtake agreements with H2 Steel, Green Steel, and SSAB to secure enough near zero steel to more than achieve their first mover's commitment. Volvo and Hydro, and you'll hear more from them today, uh, they've made a landmark agreement for supplying near-zero aluminum. Maersk 
has placed the first, world, uh, first green methanol capable container ship, the Laura Maersk, in the service and signed the biggest offtake deal of its kind with Goldwyn. Uh, Andrew uh, will probably stand up, Andrew Forrest, he's got a ship out here in the harbor that came here from, uh, was it Australia or Singapore? Singapore. Singapore. And it came from Singapore and it's running on uh, ammonia. And the future is here in port, folks, but we want you to understand, United Airlines launched a $200 million sustainable flight fund, and that includes multiple other FMC members. It's expected to support more than 5 million gallons of sustainable aviation fuel. And this is just a portion of what our members have done. So when we founded this coalition, it was born of the understanding that the climate crisis is too severe, too massive for any one player, including any government, to be able to solve it. We can create structure. The IRA, a brilliant example of structure, where an incentive has been created, capital moves to meet the incentive, suddenly you have entrepreneurs seeing a possible future in a market, and boom, off you go. And that is what's happening. And when I first uh, looked at the actions uh, that uh, the first movers have already taken, collaboration between public sector and private sector, uh, we understand that with the finance and supply and demand, those have begun to come together and they're pushing these markets forward. So, does more have to be done? Yes. But before I hand over to uh, Borga for a further progress update on the FMC, let me just say is this to everybody as I close. Every single one of you here should be a first mover. Every single one of you should move your company. If you have a company or you know a company, you're on the board, but every single one of you can push your community to be a first mover. Whether it's a school or a building that needs to be refitted, uh, energy efficiency, the largest, single, cheapest, greatest, biggest gain we can get, energy efficiency, low hanging fruit. Countless people could be moving in that direction. So I thank everybody for being here. You're gonna hear from a really fascinating panel they're going to talk the new economic reality, and I think this is uh, one of the most important things that will happen in furtherance of this agenda here at the COP. Borgabrenda.